And I welcome you to the panel arguing with and about food from the table to policy. Um, first of all, I'm thanking Ines, who is our NOMAD volunteer. If anybody has difficulty with the with anything, uh, Ines is the person to chat to. The second point uh, in general to say is that we decided to use the Zoom question, uh, the Zoom chat for posing your questions. Uh, so don't use the WUFA, but use the Zoom chat. Hello, Bernhard. <laughs> um, and what else? We are going to have the five papers in sequence and then do the question and answer afterwards because we're hoping that we might be able to maybe establish also a few interconnections between the papers that are being presented. So I'm, uh, I don't want to go there. Um, um, I'm Regina Bendix at the University of Göttingen and I'm organizing this together with Raoul Mata, um, who is affiliated with the Institut de Recherche pour le Développement, headquartered in Marseille, but he is also a postdoc affiliated with our university in Göttingen in, in the framework of the HERA project Food to Gather. And uh, we proposed a panel in food studies that shifts the gaze from preparation, food tradition, symbolism, and identity constructions to arguing about food, what economic, moral, social, beyond the social concerns are deployed um, in how actors try to imagine, shape, resist, and counter narratives uh, uh, about power and economic benefit or social benefit via food, food policy, etc. So um, we will begin the sequence with Lara Grun, who works at the University of Zurich at the Institute for Social and Cultural Anthropology and Popular Culture as a postdoc assistant. Um, and uh, she will uh, speak to us about parts of her research that she uh, completed for her dissertation. She's a postdoc now. So Lara, you would have the screen now. I hope it works with the uploading. Yeah, it seems to. Yes. Well, good afternoon. Thank you uh, for being here. Um, before I get started, I want to say many thanks to Regina and Raoul for organizing and hosting this panel. And I also want to thank the International Society for Ethnology and Folklore and, of course, the University of Helsinki uh, for doing such a great job by organizing this online congress. So um, I will start. There is this joke one of my interview partners told me. How do you know? that someone is vegan. Well, don't worry, they'll tell you. This exerated representation symbolizes one of my uh, findings in the field of ethical consumption that I would like to share with you. There is an importance placed in conveying to others what one considers the right way of consuming. It's not enough to show it in action, like shopping, eating, drinking. It needs the act of speaking to generate attention and to connect the, the practice of knowing and doing. In this presentation, I will emphasize some very specific function of talking about what is considered the right way of consuming food. And I will also discuss one specific motive that is used by doing so. I will do this from a close-up perspective, focusing on two actors talking about their everyday life practices. The narrative interviews used in this presentation emerged as a part of my field research in Switzerland, 2016 and 2017. This fieldwork was part of my dissertation project in which I asked how ethical consumption is done on a daily basis. I looked at actors in their everyday lives and addressed the question, how does ethical consumption work as an everyday practice? So 
I was not asking about global effects or dynamics which legitimize ethical consumption, but what people actually do when they consume ethically, how they do it in their living environment and what meanings they attach to this activity. In the sense of a moral anthropology, everything that people do is understood as ethical because they themselves understand this doing as good or right. So a moral anthropology has no moralizing project, emphasizing Didier Fassin. So it's not about judging what is good, moral, correct, or ethical, but about analyzing what is understood as this by the actors themselves and thus contributing to understanding. So let me now share an interview with you, along which some selected function of narrating food ethics can be discussed. This is it. Yannick Moser, a 27-year-old student of environmental science at the time, talks about his effort to convince others of his ethical lifestyle. Yannick, if you try to change something only by yourself, then it's just the way it is. It's not, the goal has not yet been reached. It is, it needs to rub off a little. I'm not the kind of person who approach people and say, you have to, or you can't. Um, but it's important that you don't just say, I'm taking myself out of this society and I'm now living sustainably by my own. You have to try to bring the others in a little bit too, me. And how do you try to do that? Yannick, first and foremost, with exemplify, so that I say it's not that difficult to be vegan, it's cool. For example, when you have a party, a vegan brunch, and then invite people over and then show, hey, you can, do, uh, you can eat so much great stuff without having any animal products in it, or ooh, yes, for example, with clothes or something like that, that you just show, hey, these jeans, they look just like other jeans. And they are not worse in terms of quality or something. So you don't have to walk around in hemp clothes or in ooze, some felt sweaters, but you can dress fashionably and sustainably. Yannick not only conveys ethical consumption in the interview situation by putting on jeans, he also does it by saying that he is demonstrating and exemplifying ethical consumption by wearing these vegan jeans. When the actors say they see themselves as an example for ethical consumption, then this takes place through and while speaking. The narrative of one's own implementation of the premises can thus be understood as functional performativity in the sense of saying makes it so. In other words, being an example needs the communicative act of saying that one sees themselves as an example. Yannick says that he tries to bring the others in a little bit too. He tries that by setting an example. It is interesting that with, well, I just say it's not that difficult to be vegan, first follows an example of this demonstration which is not physically, but verbal. The uh, scenic present tense describes a communicative act that aims to gain approval from the other person. But even in physical performances of influence, however, like the vegan brunch, brunch or wearing jeans, the act of speaking plays a central role. Yannick speaks again in the scenic present tense, hey, you can eat so much great stuff without having any animal products in it. And hey, those jeans, they look like other jeans and are not worse in terms of quality or something. That hey indicates that it's about getting someone's attention. This arousing of attention through which showing ethical behavior works performatively is told with hey via a verbal call. This narrative style reveals that even the seemingly nonverbal exemplify does not work without language use. Speech acts to generate attention are therefore essential for conveying others about ethical behavior, even when physically showing it in action.
The interview also illustrates that the mediation idea arises from a dependency on the collective because of the idea of a community in which everyone should participate, the individual is dependent on the action of others. According to Yannick, the goal can only be achieved if one owns action rub off on others, which means that others also need to act ethically. It is the idea of an effective power of food ethics in the plural that creates a central task for the ethical subject. It must not withdraw itself from society, but must get involved. It must bring others to understand and act. This is the only way that um, what one does has meaning beyond one's own living environment. One can ask, Why the mediation of ethical consumption is presented by the actors with words such as exemplify, rub off, motivate, or inspire in the interviews as a non-instructive imitation. On one hand, the question can, can be answered with a moderate self-positioning. The actors distinguish themselves from extreme positions through this narrative style. Another reading focuses on the fact that the practical implementation is not within the empowerment area of the actors. Therefore, they can only influence the effects of their actions to a limited extent. With the mentioned narrative strategy, the limitation of one's own influence is also marked. In addition, the dominance of the linguistic persuasive work is in a disproportion to the mediation work presented as a physical act. After this explanation, how conveying food ethics through language use work, we should now turn our attention to the content of this interaction. A very popular motif during my fieldwork when it came to conveying to others what one considers the right way of eating was the story of chick calling. Here it is. The story was used by the actors as a symbol for a food industry that has lost all respect from life. The only reason to be allowed to live or to have to die is gender. Chickens are sorted out and killed because they are males. The intertextual frame of reference that opens up here ties in with the motifs of gender determination and gender selection topics that are debated in other social contexts. Debates about gender selection are currently taking place in connection with modern human prenatal diag diagnostics, or it is localized and discussed under keywords such as gender side and femicide. Using the chick calling story by arguing about food, in particular, uh, why you should become vegan, difficult ethical humanitarian question can be negotiated or occupied animal in a different arena. Very interesting was the fact that many of my interview partners doing persuasion on others talked about a broader chicken who was killed. For example, Roger Heinzmann, the chairman of the Vegan Society Switzerland at the time told me, so I keep saying, let's think, let's, let's think of the basics, that the egg-laying hen has a brother who is shredded. The previously discussed connection to ethical humanitarian question is reinforced by the choice of the word brother. That brother gives the chicken a family frame of reference from which it is torn. This argumentation draws its power from its humanization of the animal so that the procedure appears all the more inhuman and the consequence seems obvious. Well, don't eat eggs anymore. In addition to the human ethical chart, in view of the local meat industry in which animals are always prematurely killed, the question may be asked why the story of chick calling is so popular and powerful in the field. It can be said that the brother chicken is an outrageous example that transports and represents the tip of the iceberg of absurdity in the current food industry. In my presentation, I focused on performative language use in everyday food ethics and asked how they are communicated. 
based on the example of chick calling, I discussed why specific motives are powerful by conveying to others what one considers the right way of eating. One of the foundings of my research is that actors of ethical consumption define themselves not only through common practices, but also through a common language use. Ethical consumers should therefore always be seen as a contemporary narrative community because the collective narration about ethical consumption proceeds according to very specific patterns. If it's the talk of Roboff, Inspire, or the story of chick calling, both are fed from a convergent narrative reservoir. So thank you so much for listening this 15 minutes to, my, to me. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Lara. Um, thank you, Lara. For presenting this and before uh, Raul introduces Alexandra, I just want to say that the brother chicken shows up in the project that uh, uh, Alexandra is involved in too. But for all the vegans out there, the brother chicken may live, but he then gets eaten too. <laughs> it's, just the, uh, it's a foil because he still has to die. So I'll, uh, I'll... Thank you, Lara. Thank you, uh, Benina. Uh, I'm now introducing the second presenter with Alexandra Hammer. She's a PhD student in cultural anthropology at the University of Göttingen in Germany. And uh, she's part of a research team that works on the role of trust and knowledge around organic food. The title of her presentation is, how can we make them know better? Biological food producers and their experiences between strict, structural strictures and reluctant consumers. Thank you. Welcome, Alexandra. Thank you. Um, I would try to give my talk without my headphones because they are not the best. <laughs> um, if it doesn't work, um, please tell me. <laughs> okay. Um, thanks for the opportunity to present my paper today. How can we make them know better? Biological food producers and their experiences between structural strangers and reluctant consumers. Organic agriculture is a site of much argumentation as it claims to be part of the solution to feeding the world without further destroying environments. Since November 2019, I've been part of an interdisciplinary research team focused on knowledge around and trust in organic food. We are interested in the question why many consumers claim to care for sustainable sustainability, but often do not buy organic food to achieve this goal. In addition to interviewing consumers, we also conduct workshops in the manner of focus groups, to which we invite ecological farmers, organic certifiers, distrib distributors, and sellers. These discussions reflect upon pressing problems of the organic sector as a whole their work days, and the role of communication in these contexts. Information is a complicated term in the setting, as actors along the organic food supply chain hold different sets of information generated from their experiences and with regional, national, and EU rules governing every step along the way. These discussion forums are my point of departure as I as I examine these actors' ways of problematizing the complex web of agricultural, political, and economic constraints and consumer them. They have the joint goal, goal of making consumers, as well as each other, understand better, depending on their role or occupation within the chain, from farmer to, su to supermarket, they command different sets of information. I will thus look at their argumentation doubly in terms of their strategic, strategic sharing or withholding of information and their actual ways of speaking. I will conclude with a reflection on underlying issues these strategies point to and the limits of communication. Workshop attendees talked about communication strategies to navigate their workdays as well as to advance the organic sector as a whole. 
They identified improving communication, both among themselves as well as between the supply chain and consumers, as a crucial strategy. Such changed communication can also mean the deliberate avoidance of speaking with certain groups about certain issues. The farmers painted a picture of themselves as caught between the demands of their livestock, plants and their natural rhythms, while also trying to fulfill the market's demands and schedules. Here, they depicted non-human entities as powerful agents, shaping organic food supply chains. Identifying this as a reality that needs to be acknowledged, farmers reflected on the need to communicate the effects of these non-human entities along the chain and to consumers more effectively. To reach this aim, they argued in favor of first-hand experience over pure information transfer. They talked about inviting their colleagues to their farms and showing them the realities of their workdays. Concerning consumers, They referred to community-supported agriculture, in German, Solidarische Landwirtschaft, as an example to successfully impart knowledge through experience. It makes the realities of seasonal impacts, weather dependencies, or crooked vegetables tangible and shows that, as Susanne, one of the attendees, argued, not everything is uniform, because that is not how nature works. Thus, in the rating, the discussions The discussions called into question Western modern conceptualizations of non-humans as mere resources to be manipulated and consumed at our will. Through recent posthumanist debates, such perspectives have also become, rele become relevant in the cultural and social sciences. In Susanna's narration, nature appears as a powerful agent, shaping our world through relations of humans and non-humans. Here, it equals a sphere that is defined by the very quality of not being able to be controlled by humans. Human practices can be altered, if not merely, but at least partly through communication. That is not to say that the actors did not reflect upon the highly technical nature of their agricultural practices and in turn of our food. They criticized the steady growth of marketing standards that enforce ideas of uniformity and of constantly available flawless food. Communicating and acknowledging the impacts of these non-human entities entails the potential to better adjust one's practices accordingly along the entire chain. This strategy also manifests itself in the call for seasonal shopping practices as it is visible in debates about sustainable consumption. But when it comes to sharing such information with customers, the actors identified the anonymity of a food market as a problem in which communication between farmers or processors and consumers rarely takes place. Hans pointed out how supermarkets own organic labels deliberately equalize products from different origins, concealing information about the sites of production and the actors and practices involved. Additionally, the added value of organic food falls short due to small labels that, with limited space, only inform minimally. But it is also the offered range of goods that limits as well as enables consumers in new choices and is dependent on the retailer's knowledge and interests. This filters through the supermarket enables companies to control the flow of information, leaving consumers and farmers alike dependent on the store's communication policies. When one of my colleagues asked whether an inclusion of those actors may be a solution to this problem, Hans saw little use in the strategy, as they would still pursue their own interests. Others argued in favor of such an inclusion. Martin, a farmer and distributor, stated, Retail has an incredible amount of power. It must be part of the solution. Our current crises are too big to take the time to convince 80 million consumers. Thus, these particip participants pushed to convince the supermarket buyers. Retailers hold a special position. That is what these strategies make plain. But retailers rarely accepted our workshop invitation. For the discussions, The power imbalance from trade to processing to pharma is harsh, particularly when it comes to price negotiations. Concerning retailers, I can see 
say that prices are more or less dictated, Stefan, the sales representative of an egg distributor, said. When asked to write this down on our discussion summary, he hesitated, stating that he would not want to put it in those exact words. Thomas, the representative of an organic juice factory, called out those violent and cynical structures of the market. The discussion has thematized how a drought causing crop failures may prove positive for pricing. And he exclaimed, a good harvest is bad, this is cynical. For which farmer would wish for environmental disasters in order to keep the prices from dropping? The call to cooperate, to stand together against food retail chains, was repeated in all the workshops. Several producers joined in forming groups over the years. One representative described how these groups collect their own figures to assess the developments in their respective sectors. This puts them in better negotiation positions with retailers and allows for informed decisions. Another mutual support strategy is to allow those farmers to sell first whose vegetables are in danger of expiring. But cooperation might also include the withholding of raw goods without adjusting prices in situations of oversupply. Philip, the representative of a crane processing and marketing company, reports on a case where everybody just shut up about the oversupply of spelt and did not lower prices. This worked well, he told us. When it comes to pricing, there are also legal obstacles in place in the form of antitrust laws, which complicate particular topics of conversation. The chicken farmer Simon depicts the following. When you visit a retailer for negotiations, you sit down with the buyer at the table on which you already find a sign telling you not to talk about retail prices. Many identify this as a problem, as the production of organic food is more expensive to begin with. Retailers calculate the markups for retail prices relative to these purchase prices. This often makes organic food even more expensive for consumers. Those at the beginning of the supply chain experience the disadvantage. While the retailers can profit more from organic food, for which they calculate a bigger profit margin. Hence, some actors problematize the way in which buyers and retailers are loath to give up on the logic of the market economy in favor of a logic of what one participant called responsible thinking. In debates about sustainability, the finger is often pointed at consumers who are not willing to pay more for better food. The workshops called attention to the ways in which those high prices are not just the natural result of more cost-intensive organic practices, but also of active decisions as well as routinized retail practices guided by the logic of the market. These practices exclude people from lower income households from the organic food market. The inequality in negotiating practices along the chain thus reinforce also the inequality of purchasing power within society. While the workshops had helped us understand the communication strategies actors along the chain employ, there were some hints in my remarks so far regarding the ways of speaking to use their limestone they employed during these dis discussions. Often, statements were handled as given facts, therefore no further explanation was given. Particularly poignant was the claim of one potato distributor. We all know the wish for regional causes the death of the German farmer. Only upon request, he explained how the desire for regionally grown potatoes is absurd. Enabling potato farming in regions where the soil does not meet the need of the plants, resource intensive practices would be needed. In other cases, discussions purposefully refrained from elaborating on certain topics or were reluctant to write down a verbally formulated critique. While the lack of explanation points to an assumed shared knowledge among the discussants, the hesitation illustrates how the power inequality along the chain also brings about silence and avoidance. This censoring of speech points to the clearly felt positionality in the supply chain, which goes hand in hand with the which goes hand in hand with different levels of power and the potential to take part in consumer communication. 
These problems can be addressed only partially through mere information transfer. Reflecting upon the limits of dialogue, geographer Silver Wright points out how the context of dialogues shape what may be said and thought and acknowledged and by who and how. She argues that dialogues have the potential to reproduce those exact contexts, its underlying logics, power structures, and exclusionary potentials. Therefore, refusal can be a way to reframe and recenter debates. As different discussions argue in favor of different reactions to their current situation, deliberately including the retail versus questioning the power imbalance itself, they paint an ambivalent picture of the underlying perspectives of the nature of the market and its possibility and necessity for change. In these occupational settings, arguing about food thus turns into arguing about production and distribution contexts and the question of the limits of communication. Wright points to the very human-centered framing of dialogue that privileges certain ways of being in the world. Debates not only mirror norms and rules, but also set them. Thus, the farmer's focus on experience-based knowledge, based knowledge transfer reflects this very issue. They focus on embodied forms of interactions that are beyond language-based exchanges. That eagerness to make the needs and influences of soils, the weather, animals or plants heard, and thus to include them into these conversations, questions a concept of communication that merely relies on language. Um, thank you very much. I will stop sharing now. Thank you, thank you very much, Alexandra. Um, I think uh, those who came later, we will do the questions at the end, but you can certainly write specific questions to Lara or Alexandra or the next ones already in the chat. So we have something to draw from when we get to the end. Our next speaker is Cristina Romanelli. She's a doctoral student in sociology. Um, and uh, her the paper she is sharing with us is that what she will start or embark on for her dissertation. And the paper title is More Peace, Less Meat. Floor is yours. Yes, okay, good. <laughs> so thank you very much for the opportunity to be part of such an interesting panel. Um, I will present you my PhD project and build upon some of the central ideas that will be developed in the next years. Although there are two main disciplines involved, so not only sociology, but also sciences of information and communication, I will focus today on the sociological approach. And I have just one precision. Uh, I am enrolled at the University Nova of Lisbon, but that situation will change by October. I will be enrolled at the University of Lille in France, and I will apply for a joint doctorate with the University of Lisbon. So that's why those three logos are there. So my PhD project is inserted in the context of a growing scientific, political, and media support for predominantly plant-based diets in Europe. In the last years, national food guidelines have been updated and public authorities have been trying to encourage citizens to transform their eating practices. One of the main target groups of such policies are young adults who are currently heading the reduction in meat consumption in Europe. Additionally, individuals with high levels of education seem to be more inclined to adopt vegetarian, sustainable, and healthy eating practices. In this sense, universities could play a key role in public policy implementation. But Portugal and France are the only European countries that have established national policies that promote the consumption of plant-based foods in universities. In Portugal in 2017, a law has established that all public canteens have to offer a daily option without animal-based foods. In France, the public body responsible for food catering in universities has established also in 2017 that all universities should offer a daily vegetarian option. Nonetheless, since this is not a legislation, some universities haven't adapted their offer yet. And that's why a climate and resilience bill has recently received an amendment that will compel public universities to offer a daily vegetarian option. So that will be probably later this year. 
Considering these developments, my PhD research will explore how the context of higher education studies, an important moment of transition, could be favorable or not to food reforms in France and Portugal. The project is organized in two sets of objectives. Uh, the first concerns intermediaries that disseminate information and implement policies. In this case, mainly universities and bodies responsible for food catering but also less visible actors such as faculty members, for example. Here I'm interested in the perception of food policies by these actors, the ways in which they appropriate and implement them, in particular through the provision of meals and using information and communication as levers of public action. The second concerns university students, the target audience of such policies. Here I'm interested in the perception of food policies and their implementation, in students' eating practices and in their interest in issues that may lead them to more plant-based diets and become engaged in actions to promote them. Individuals who are indifferent or opposed to these food reforms will not be neglected. Quite the contrary, their testimonies will unfold barriers to adherence to more plant-based diets, discrepancies between access to information and intention to change, as well as other priorities related to food. So where will I focus my research? An in-depth field work will be conducted in universities that do not only meet national determinations, but also create supplementary initiatives or already have a consolidated vegetarian offer. The main field work will be carried out at the University of Lisbon, where a canteen has served vegetarian macrobiotic meals since the 80s, and at the University of Lille, where all canteens offer a plant-based option. For the rest of the field work, I am considering mainly the University of Coimbra in Portugal that has banned beef from its menus, and three universities in France, uh, Strasbourg, Grenoble, and Poitiers. As to the methodology, I am currently in the exploratory phase, during which I have conducted some online interviews and netnography in social medias used by students. The next steps, uh, I will map policies related to the subject in Portugal and France, knowing that there is almost nothing before 2015. Um, then I will study in detail the most relevant policies and the communication that is made about them, including the media devices that are used and the spatial context in which they are inserted. And that is why this work will be complemented by ethnography and ethnographic incursions at universities. Next, in order to understand how policies are perceived, appropriated and implemented in universities, I will conduct semi-structured interviews. And additionally, ethnographic incursions in canteens will provide data such as the daily practices of canteen staff and the meals proposed in different venues, for example. At last, I will conduct an online self-administered survey with students. This methodology will allow the segmenting of the sample in different clusters, according mainly to sociodemographic characteristics, uh, practices and importance according to food-related issues, such as the environment and health, for example. And the following step will be the selection of students from these clusters to carry out semi-structured interviews and focus groups. So now I'll share a few reflections on the role of intermediaries and students in the diffusion and implementation of uh, food policy. In these images, you see an initiative created by an association in France. It's a green week, as they call it, uh, that they organize with some universities to offer options without any animal-based ingredients. There you see a vegan chocolate mousse and also some posters to inform students about the initiative. And that was at the University of Besançon in April this year. So first of all, uh, the concept of public policy has been much discussed by different disciplines and interpreted theoretically in various and sometimes contrasting ways. There is therefore no consensus, as you might know. So in this PhD research, uh, public policies are seen as a set of decisions in the form of plans, guidelines, regulations, campaigns that seek to change a specific situation institutionalized by public authorities and conceived directly or indirectly by different social actors, they reflect the diversity of objectives, interests, and ideologies of stakeholders, as well as their inherent asymmetries 
and inconsistencies. Therefore, as much as governments and decision makers play a fundamental role in policy creation, diffusion, and implementation, actors such as NGOs and associations, for example, cannot be ignored. Even if sometimes less visible or articulated, they have the potential to become key players in promoting and inserting social demands into the political agenda. Moreover, even the intermediaries appointed by the authorities, such as universities in this case, can go beyond official directives and define their own goals and strategies for policy implementation. The previous slide shows an example with an initiative between an association and a specific university. Many universities, they are not interested in such initiatives, and so sometimes this can be a matter of local or even individual action. So in this sense, uh, food reforms intended by public policies depend to a large extent on intermediaries appointed by the authorities, as well as on the ways they appropriate, interpret, and implement policies. The public collective catering is one such intermediary that has gained importance in recent decades with the increase of meals eaten out of home. In the case of universities, more specifically, there has also been an increase in the number of students. In this sense, by providing healthy vegetarian meals on a large scale, public university canteens could contribute to the improvement of population's nutritional status and to the transition to more plant-based diets. However, action taken in universities are not limited to food offer or follow a top-down orientation. There are also initiatives aimed at raising awareness among students and influencing decision makers, many of them designed by less visible actors. One example is the Green Monday campaign for the adoption of vegetarian meals once a week in France. Uh, you can see a poster of it on the slide. So it created by two lecturers, it was immediately adopted by public universities. And in 2020, it received an institutional support from the Ministry of Ecological Transition. Here I bring you more examples of actions created by different intermediaries in France. On top left, we see an online cooking workshop organized by the University of Lille, during which chefs that work at the canteens shared recipes with students, some of them vegetarian. Below it, there is a group of lecturers at the University of Strasbourg that created a petition to ask for a vegan option in the local canteens. In the middle, we see an image shared by the University of Grenoble in their Instagram account with some gestures for the planet, including a decrease in meat consumption. At last, on the right, we see a vegan menu created by the University of Poitiers for a special event with an association. So you can see there is much more that can be done besides changing the food offer. There are events, workshops, petitions, and lots of communication on the subject on social media. And there are also other actors, such as lecturers and associations that are involved in many of these actions. Support is also largely motivated by the dissemination of scientific knowledge on the subject. This highlights the importance of the academic scope not only with regard to the studies developed by researchers, but also to training and courses offered at universities and to thesis and internships carried out by students. In this sense, it is possible to think of universities as centers for evaluating, disseminating, and legitimizing criticism of conventional agri-food systems, as well as incubators for initiatives that may generate significant social, political, and economical impacts. Food reforms also depend on the social positions and on the life course of the target populations, as well as on their perception of issues related to food. Young university students in particular come from very different social groups, have a socially situated relationship with food and live an important transition between youth and adulthood. Starting higher education often leads to leaving the family home, which generates the need to shop for groceries and to cook and facilitates the expression of individual preferences. So this is the moment when young adults begin to form patterns of autonomous food consumption. In addition, the influence of family members is a key factor in maintaining vegetarian practices, although reports on the absence of support are recurrent. As a result, for many individuals, it is only possible to become vegetarian when they reach an age 
that provides them with a certain independence from parental control. But even if students continue to live with family members, changes in their eating practices can be favored by the simple possibility of choosing a meal among those proposed at canteens and by the contact with their field of study and with different forms of knowledge that circulate in universities. In this sense, the way students conceptualize food and develop a personal system of beliefs and values may influence their choices later in adulthood, providing policymakers with ample possibilities to guide food consumption habits. Additionally, as they enter university, students develop new sociability networks that could contribute to the shift of practices related to social origin. New generations appear to be strongly influenced in their purchase decisions and eating practices by significant others such as parents, but also friends and teachers. Consequently, through interactions with people with different backgrounds, including those that follow less current lifestyles, ideologies, and practices, students can be influenced and also influence others. So, as much as the involvement of faculty members and administrative staff is essential for the continuity and contractual fulfillment of initiatives at universities, it is the students who take the lead on many campuses. They can become, therefore, important agents of change, either through well-articulated actions supported by other actors or through autonomous initiative and even demands at the individual level. So I leave you with this image shared by a student association in France during the demonstrations for the Climate and Resilience Bill uh, that I mentioned before, it was in May. And the message here is that students will act on their scale, but they also will put pressure on public bodies so they do their part. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Um, before introducing uh, our next presenter, I would like to remind again that we are collecting uh, questions for the presenters on the Zoom chat, so feel free to ask. Our next uh, presenter is Gina, Gina Song Lopez. Uh, she's a first year doctoral student at the Center for East and Southeast Asian Studies at Lund University in Sweden. Uh, her research focuses on plant-based food advocacy in Asia, and the title of her presentation is Does the Anthropocene Dream of Plant-Based Pork? Sustainable Food Transition and Advocacy in Asia. Gina, uh, you have the floor. And, well, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, let me find my presentation. Oh, there it is. Okay, can you see it? Oh, good, okay. So, okay, good. So I'll just, I'll just go straight to it. <laughs> uh, the Anthropocene Dream of Plant-Based Pork, Sustainable Food Transition and Advocacy in Asia. Translating, recreating, and replacing meat with plant-based proteins has been an ongoing project in vegan and vegetarian diets around the world. These meatless cuisines have most often associated being, uh, being associated with protein substitutes in the form of tofu, beans, lentils, seitan, and so on. However, anyone paying attention to veganism or engaging in meatless food practice will notice that great effort is being placed in changing perception of vegan and vegetarian food as lacking protein or being bland, as, as it's illustrated in this social media hashtag. Um, what is more, better understanding of cognitive behavioral gaps underlining meat consumption has elevated the matter of addressing taste preference to the fore. It has resulted in greater focus on improving the flavors, textures, and affordability of meat-like products to major priority across environmental, animal-friendly, and sustainable food agendas and industries. In addition to their increasingly commercially favored prospects, Interesting plant-based meat substitutes stem from their potential to address our dependency on animal proteins and in curtailing the environmental impact of the livestock industry. This momentum has been brought about not only by the promise of a technological fix in the form of meatless meat, but also through the support of key actors, more specifically animal advocates, vegan activists, and a growing number of ethically and climatically minded consumers. This popularity of the latest generation of plant-based meat substitutes uh, 
heralded by companies like Beyond Meat or Impossible Foods is, is mirrored in Asia, where investors and consumers have enthusiastically embraced novel meat as food. However, in the context of China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan, rather than replacing beef in burgers and steaks, it is more relevant to talk about replacing pork in dumplings and lunch boxes. At the same time, meatless diets are not particularly novel in the region, due to the long history of vegetarian practice. What is unprecedented at this time is the greater convergence of agendas and actors involved in the material and semiotic translation of meatless food. In this paper, I briefly trace the actor networks arising with and about plant-based meat in the sinocultural sphere. Using the case of a novel plant-based pork product, I begin exploring the roles of animal activists, food advocates, businesses, food fairs, and the vegetal proteins transforming food waste in the region. The Asian foodscape is undergoing a process of diversification, westernization, and mutification due to greater economic affluence. In China, these developments are leading to growing concerns over food sustainability, health, and animal welfare, most notably recognizing the challenges arising from dietary for from changing dietary patterns, Chinese dietary guidelines began outlining the reduction of meat consumption in 2016, listing diversified, diversified sources of proteins such as soybeans and eggs, uh, along with, with, uh, with eggs and, and soy protein. And also uh, they included uh, a section on vegetarian diets for the first time. However, reducing meat consumption and production is no easy feat that can be achieved through guidelines and advocacy alone. It requires the uprooting of deeply ingrained social technical food regimes characterized by alimentary institutions, market structures, and cultural preferences. Here, I am employing a term borrowed from sustainability studies. Social technical regimes or social technical systems refer to industrial service sectors that enable everyday life to function, such as water, energy, transport, and of course, food infrastructures. All these sectors are comprised by scientific and technical aspects, but are also informed by political and social processes as well, hence the social technical. Pork meat and, pork meat and the pork industry occupy an important role in dietary habits in China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. The Chinese word for meat, raw, is commonly understood to imply pork. Furthermore, despite the current diversification of local tastes, China has remained the top consumer and producer of pork in the world. In fact, the country has its very own strategic pork reserve. Uh, this reserve has recently been put into use, for example, uh, to control food prices due to the swine flu outbreak and also the trade war with the United States and, of course, the COVID pandemic. Um, so given this background, uh, it is no surprise that the flagship modern plant-based meat product coming from the region is a pork meat analog. Omni pork, shin to raw, is a plant-based pork product made of shiitake mushroom, non-GMO soy, pea protein, and rice. It was developed by Omni Foods, the food subsidiary of the Hong Kong-based social venture group Green Monday. Launched in 2018, Omni pork was initially offered as a pork meat substitute at selected restaurants in Hong Kong, and quickly expanded its distribution to Taiwan, China, Korea, Japan, and beyond. Within two years, its product range grew from pork meats to lunch and slices, strips, and ready-to-eat meals. Um, yes, these are now available in supermarkets, restaurants, and convenience stores chains in Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan, Macau, uh, and the year 2020 marked a milestone in Omni, Omni Pork's mainstream success. The flagship new pork, as directly translated from Chinese, joined Starbucks menus across China alongside Beyond Meat and Oatly in April, and McDonald's and McCafes in Hong Kong and Macau in October. In order to understand the mainstream acceptance of plant-based food in the region, it is necessary to look at the actors involved in the material and semiotic translation of meatless food. Although the primary and most basic function of food is that of nourishment, food is also a system of communication. Food habits not only illustrate taste preferences, but also embody identities, moralities, and narratives. In the case of plant-based and vegan food, these as aspects are particularly central to the practice, uh, which is also like illustrated in, in Lara's presentation. Uh, alternative proteins such as plant-based meat and milk, uh, meat and milk challenge and modify social constructs of food and edibility. This process is informed by material and discursive factors. The material pertains to the technical, scientific, and visceral elements involved in production and consumption. 
taste, texture, ingredients, recipes, formulas, chef, and manufacturers all contribute to the development and creation of the new generation of meat substitutes. On the other hand, animal advocates, vegan activists, businesses, and marketing actors are involved in the discursive function by moralizing protein intake and normalizing alternatives. It is in the discursive realm will this transmutation of plant-based protein to meatless meat take place. It is no coincidence that more vegans, vegetarians, and flexitarians are joining the dining table at the same time as variants of, of the phrase animals are friends, no food, are being heard and seen across Asia. Animal and uh, vegan food advocates have played a central role in the introduction of modern discourses about meatless diet in, the, in, chi in China. They also constitute an emerging and highly active social movement in Taiwan. These groups are now also key supporters in the promotion of novel plant-based meat substitutes in the region. In Taiwan, the animal protection movement has sought to transform social natural relations through legislative and business lobbying since its inception in the 1990s. However, in the new, it is the newest generation of activists which has, has actively embraced the concept of veganism as an identity and cause for advocacy. In line with their global counterparts, these vegan advocates are highly engaged with material performances, focusing on the normalization of animal-free lifestyles by promoting ethical and plant-based consumption and actively engaging with market mechanisms. It is in this context that plant-based meats such as omnipore have come to take the center stage. Dishes made with plant-based pork are now widely featured and adapted into various formats to appeal to local and globalized tastes at home, at restaurants, and at food stores. Omnipurg and its plant-based ingredients are both guests of honors and hosts in vegan, vegetarian, and sustainable dining spaces. So, for example, here you can see um, Omnipurg being featured in a home, home cookie website and also um, at, in the menu of a very trendy vegan restaurant that opened in 2019 in Taipei. Uh, so this new pork product is just uh, are, is being featured, reviewed, and compared in social media posts and blogs by high-profile vegan influencers, such as in the in these two channels um, that from Taiwan. Uh, in the first one, we can see uh, it's the it's a review from the first first day where, where in which uh, only pork was available in a Taiwan supermarket. So the, uh, these these two influencers went and bought the product and took it home and cooked it and, and did a taste test. And in the second channel, um, it's uh, it's uh, it's being featured as a very uh, very cheap uh, high protein uh, alternative. So this growing interest in meatless food is also illustrated by popular public events where omnipotent products can be found. For example, vegan fairs such as Taiwan Vegan Frenzy and the No Meat Market. The Taiwan Vegan Frenzy is the longest running vegan fair in Taiwan. Uh, it, it has been active since, since 2016, uh, and, it, it, and it takes place a couple of times a year. Uh, the Nomid Market is a more recent, starting in 2019, but, it for so, but so far has had uh, some event collaborations with big companies such as ASUS. Um, but, so in the picture here in the, in the corner, it's the big day picnic out with both. Um, so these recurrent and mobile pop-up markets bring plant-based food and businesses to the general public and also serve as Community, uh, community building spaces for foodies, animal advocates, and sustainable lifestyle enthusiasts. At the fore of the phenomenon is not only the, no the normalization of plant-based food, but strategically appealing to local cuisine and taste, but the redefinition of meat diets as well. Vegetarian food and the employment of meat substitutes such as tofu and faux meat have been prevalent in the region long predating current developments. Over the past millennia, meatless diets have most commonly been associated with Chinese religious practices, primarily Chinese Buddhism, but also including some approaches to Taoism, informing practices ranging from short-term to lifelong meat abstinence, and most commonly performed through selective meat avoidance during religiously significant dates of the lunar calendar, which usually are the first of the lunar month and the 15th of the lunar month. This cultural context has sometimes been hailed as a factor facilitating the spread of animal-friendly avian lifestyles in the region. And in other cases, preconceptions about meatless food as a religious practice is seen as an important obstacle for the effective spread of animal ethics and modern vegan and vegetarian food rationales. So these two excerpts are from uh, some interviews and also uh, meeting with some uh, representatives on the street. So uh, when to ask about the, their, their perception of how Buddhism helps spread animal animal rights, uh, this is some of their 
of their answers that can read. Ultimately, plant-based food provides a material discursive medium for the convergence, negotiation, and cooperation among the different actors that share overlapping interests in middle science. In China, it is demonstrated by the prominent food advocacy work of groups such as the Good Food Fund and the newly formed China Vegan Society. The Good Food Fund has been conducting the Good Food Summit since 2017. The summit brings together various representatives promoting food sustainability at plant-based sites. The China Vegan Society, which was formally founded earlier this year, held an independent dialogue under the UN Food System Summit in May, bringing together advocacy, ad sustainability advocates, animal and vegan activists, Buddhist and Taoist practitioners, and green business representatives to discuss plant-based food system transformation in China. So here we can see three of the main topics they discuss where religion and the role of the uh, plant-based meat industry is, have, have their own panel. In Taiwan, animal activists and vegetarian Buddhists share spaces in advocacy workshops and lectures, eating at meat free establishments and marching together in an animal rights demonstration. For example, the Life Conservation Conservationist Association, which is um, also mentioned in the previous slide, uh, they they it's it's uh, lead, led by a, a Buddhist nun, and the organization combines Buddhist teaching of uh, teachings about compassion and mercy for animals with modern animal ethics. Finally, and most materially illustrative, uh, novel plant-based meat products such as Omni Pork are popular across both sides of the Taiwan Strait, casting a wide net among diversely motivated meat-avoiding consumers with cruelty-free, GMO-free, and Buddhist-friendly ingredients. So, for example, that, uh, the fact that a meal might be Buddhist-friendly does not necessarily mean that it's cruelty-free because it might use uh, eggs or dairy, or alternately, it might use caged eggs, so that is not cruelty-free. And um, if a, a meal is vegan, it's not necessarily Buddhist friendly because it might contain garlic or eggs or even alcohol, which the Buddhist people avoid. So these examples help illustrate that although human advocacy actors and networks play a key role in promoting meatless food, it can be conversely noted that the new generation of plant-based meat has been instrumental in introducing issues of animal protection and environmental sustainability to the table. From the standpoint of plant-based meat, food scientists, activists, advocates, consumers, businesses, shiitake mushrooms, soy, peas, rice, and deeply engage, are, are all deeply engaged in a material and semiotic translation of meat, displaying an increasingly re relevant role in the dietary transition project towards sustainable food systems in Anthropocene. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Uh, I think the French students will not be uh, proselytizing to Buddhists because probably there are onions in the French vegetarian or vegan diet. We come to the last paper now by Zara Pozzi, who is a PhD candidate in social anthropology at the University of Manchester. Uh, she um, did her paper together with Amin Slim, who um, is not present but was in basically a, a field collaborator of hers during her two years of fieldwork in Northeast Tunisia. Please, Sara, you go ahead. So um, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for being here. Um, I am about to present a reflection that emerges as a part of my dissertation draft and uh, in uh, specific from a chapter that we reason on seed diversity reciprocal networks and ideas around normal dignified life on a Tunisian farm. And this reflection is based on almost two years of fieldwork in Northeast Tunisia. And it was possible uh, thanks to my informants willingness to open their houses and share their concerns with me. And to them uh, goes a big thank you today. Um, also, the reflection uh, is a conjunct effort and uh, part of a longer conversation I've been having with uh, a colleague of mine and a friend, Dr. Amin Slim, who today cannot be here because he's in Tunisia celebrating the harvesting opening with farmers and agricultural minister. So um, to begin with, I will move quickly to share, you, um, to share with you an excerpt from my field notes as it is representative of the context from where our discussion point take off today, which is uh, smallholder farming in contemporary Tunisia. 
Homer, uh, who you see in the picture, busy with sowing his land, was one of my first farmer informant, head of his household of five. He owns four hectares of land and rent 30 more from his neighbors and makes a living by cultivating old varieties of wheat. So on a scorching mean July morning, sitting on a carpet floor, not an Omar had lined up. I was witnessing with increasing discomfort my informant's interaction with their guests. For almost half an hour, Omar had addressed with growing irritation the pressing question from an, agri an agronomy student who, accompanied by a regional representative of the Minister of Agriculture, collected data on smallholders' cultivation of ancient wheat varieties across the region. When asked if he had ever tried to grow higher yielding varieties, Omar, pointing uh, at uh, the land visible across the open door, snapped, how could I cultivate those with the land I have? I would not even cover the transport cost to the silos with the price I would get from the state. And so uh, to be noted that traditional varieties of uh, sea of wheat um, um, are better priced on the informal wheat market. Uh, smallholder farmers such as Omar uh, represent 62% of cereal producer in Tunisia. And uh, producing mostly for self-consumption, many of those households often reproduce indigenous varieties of seed, vernacularly named al buzur al-Kadima, literally meaning uh, old seed. They are passed down from ancestors, uh, and they are the result of on-farm select selection pra practices adapted uh, through time to different ecological conditions. So today, with uh, this uh, reflection, um, Mm, I want to uh, highlight how uh, by up to upholding the efforts of some Tunisian smallholders in time of late capitalism to stay, to remain on their land by cultivating and trading all the uh, varieties of wheat. Uh, I will try to interrogate a current attempt led by the National Gene Bank to draft a legal framework to amend the existing 1999 seed law. And the paper uh, will first contextualize Tunisia's wheat diversity, and then it will move to discuss how modern farming ideologies have abruptly cut the multiplicity of social networks previously developed around cereal multiplication and production. And the conclusive thesis will point at how amending the 1999 law conceivably constitute an essential, essential element of a wider and much needed agricultural strategy. Um, so about uh, wheat diversity in Tunisia. Uh, Durum wheat originally spread from the Fertile Crescent where uh, its dom domestication dates back to 10,000 to 15,000 BC to reach North Africa around 7,000 BC. How do we know uh, about the centers of origin of a cultivated plant? So historically, the center of origin of a cultivating plant is the region with the greatest diversity of a plant species. And so we can, because of that, we can consider Tunisia a center of secondary a center, excuse me, of a secondary region for durum uh, wheat, given its uh, large display of local varieties. And um, how this uh, diversification was brought about. Tunisian farmers and shepherds have long led processes of seed selection and multiplication to fit their ecosystem and production condition. As Aistara points out, seeds are made up of all their previous uh, kin and exchanges, connecting ancient growers with their modern descendant. Varietal diversity across the century has um, so emerged and developed through such network of practice as farmers source, exchange, experiment, and conserve the seeds. And it is in this context that um, we can grasp the full meaning of biodiversity if we locate it within the specific social, social and ecological context generated by reciprocal relationship and practices. Uh, center to our paper is then to highlight how despite attempts to stabilize and classify species of wheat, its multiplicity and diversity rather index the constant uh, process of becoming of seed population. And um, at this point, uh, um, 
Escobar um, fa famous passage on biodiversity introduces the discourse on modernity in agriculture and opening the scene to how such discourse was interrupted, uh, uh, interrupted the seed network exchanges. So from a discursive perspective, biodiversity does not exist in an absolute sense, rather it anchors a discourse that articulated a new relation between nature and society in global context of science, cultures, and economies. As a scientific discourse, biodiversity can be seen as a prime instance of co-production of network. And uh, as we all know, the Green Revolution in the 50s was brought about by applying ex existing technologies such as modern irrigation project pesticide fertilizer in agriculture. And uh, high uh, yielding varieties of wheat were a central, um, a central element of such operation. <coughs> in fact, on the brink of the 20th century, the advent of scientific breeding led by scientists resulted in improved or modern or high yielding varieties, crucial to the rap uh, rapid expansion of wheat production. We also all know how although such seeds have helped curb food shortages in many parts of the world, the progressive agro-commodification of inputs and knowledge has raised many concerns. And here I'm not detailing, but it's a well-known fact. Uh, so uh, how did uh, that play out uh, in Tunisia? In Tunisia, traditional wheat varieties, despite yielding less than conventional one, represent an important reservoir or genetic traits adapted to uh, local condition. They are resistant to drought and salinity and do not require costly inputs such as fertilizer or pesticides. These seeds were the basis of cereal production until 1970s, uh, when the introduction of high yielding varieties constituted one of the measures through which modernization of perceived unsuitable farming practices were, was pursued. Coupled with subsequent market uh, oriented reform, especially liberalization of prices, land and input, farmers who could not afford high yielding varieties and related inputs were pushed to the margin. Um, and uh, such marginalization was later exacerbated by uh, the May 1999 law, which I mentioned, which uh, certifies, uh, certified a list of tradable seeds that excluded traditional varieties, deepening the breach of the reciprocal relationship between smallholders, their ecosystem and their livelihoods. The law in particular identified uh, and isolate uh, seeds and plants upholding a certain productive and commercial values. So homogeneity, morphological uniformity and stability. It meanwhile did not permit the identification, registration, exchange, marketing uh, and marketing of old varieties, uh, which are morphological diverse and not homogeneous. So the simplification of the base of this election of the good, desirable seed bend the dynamicity intrinsic to seed adaptation and transformation and further cut the social networks that had flourished around the multiplication of old seeds on the farm. Um, and here I'm uh, focusing on the social disconnect, how the social disconnect happened. The devaluation and alienation of old varieties together with labor commodification on the farm and lack of policies supporting small order operation has over time resulted in social alienation or isolation of their producers, eroding former social uh, dynamism and reciprocity between autonomous actors in the countryside. And here by auto autonom um, with autonomous actor, I mean uh, um, economic autonomy, which has been considered the primary source of honorability, honorability among unequal actor in the farm. Um, and uh, um, all these left as a single household struggling to face social reproduction constraint alone. And here I'm also bringing you back uh, to the vignette at the beginning of my presentation, giving you a little bit of pretext to the interaction described. Um, preceding the interview with the student, Omar had eloquently addressed his dissatisfaction with the tactless inertia of the local agricultural headquarters by intimating that he would answer the question only be flows, only for money. 
um, the regional representative smiled and forcibly ignored Omar's request, inviting the young researcher to proceed with their questionnaire. A symbolic yet powerful act, Omar's tongue-in-cheek remark showed that uh, what was at stake was not, of course, money, but the long unresolved power struggle with the regional minister of agriculture. He did his part, never ceasing to work toward the autonomy of his household, shifting his strategies toward, an, uh, toward attempts at modern wheat cultivation before eventually returning to work with traditional varieties. But what about the other side of, other, of the relationship? Um, Omar's vocal quest for dignity on that midsummer day seems uh, clearly direct, directed by the desire to be seen by the Tunisian state and be acknowledged as an economic and social actor who um, can exercise autonomy. His household reproduction, like many small orders across Tunisia, was constantly threatened by, lack, um, by the lack of reciprocal gains from the state, which focused instead on perpetuating the interests of large owners through patronage logics. After the guests left, Omar's wife and I disposed of the food in silence until a frustrated Omar vented out. What do we get out of this? They come in with nothing, not even a yogurt for the kids. And afterwards, once we received 30 people, gave our bread, our time, nobody ever acknowledged the effort. This is not like it is supposed to be. They live happily with their information, but what about helping with farming materials or training for my son, Yasser? Nothing. Of course, Yasser left for the army. I'm doing it only for Amin, who is a, a real man, but I'm so tired, so, so tired of it. And Amin, um, who is a the real honorable man, uh, actually cared about his relationship with the farmers and supported smallholders' trade of old seeds, even uh, though he was not required in his position as a gene bank researcher. Farmers want to sell and they want to sell well, um, I mean, often uh, remarked uh, whenever he spoke to the public. As the Strater notes, the core of our understanding of commodification lies not in buying and selling as such, but in the quality of the relationships. And I mean, for the past 15 years, has worked closely with farmers in the remote areas of the country where old varieties of wheat and barley are cultivated to preserve plants' genetic makeup, ecosystem, but also to support households' um, social reproduction. And these constitute an example of our networks of care uh, across social groups could generate viable futures. I mean, uh, supported farmers, especially by reconnecting them to other networks of producers and buyers. By the end of my fieldwork through I mean contacts, uh, Omar uh, managed to scale up his farm operation by joining forces with an association of producers. Such initiative, however, are still quite sporadic, circumventing uh, the 1999 law only because what are traded are the transformed products and not the seeds. As Omar Case points, out, points at, the new generation of youth, like his son left for the army because um, he was belittled in his role um, by staying on his dead farm and um, didn't manage to have a salary for himself. So this is a, a exemplificative of a situation, a general situation involving youth in Tunisia. So the, the, the new generation of youth won't remain on the land if this means struggling to make a decent life. Uh, at the policy level, then, an attempt to act in such a direction is currently led by the National Gene Bank, drafting a ministerial decree to amend the law. In liaison uh, with university researchers, NGOs, trade unions, and farmers, the Gene Bank is studying to set up a system to include indigenous seed and plants in the formal legal provision through uh, establishing a, a, national a national register of autochthon varieties and a related sectorial commission in charge of managing the different aspects of the reproduction and commercialization of old seeds. The attempt is uh, massive, not only because the amendment of the law needs to be properly thought through to avoid the loopholes that would favor private patenting, uh, patenting, but political impasses and technical issues need also to be sorted out. 
As highlighted by the researcher at the, at the Gene Bank, the initiative has been conceived as a possible avenue to support smallholders uh, and preserve biodiversity and does not intend to create opposition among varieties. Rather, it intends to um, multiply the chances of adding value to wheat reproduction in different ecosystems. So, uh, possible, possibly uh, drawbacks of translating practices into law, such as increasing bureaucratic, uh, the bureaucratic loads for farmers or legal monitoring of farm operation, need to be weighed against the current marginalization of smallholders excluded from legal trading opportunities. And it will possibly uh, come down to the ability to create a virtuous network of advocacy and community practices in which um, farmers, activists and researchers and possibly politician participation and mobilization reflect the different stakeholders interests and concerns. As uh, with the organic movement in Costa Rica, uh, who in uh, 2006 managed to pass a law on organic agriculture to reconnect diversity, the amendment will have to guarantee protection of old seeds and set clear responsibility for their reproduction. So within uh, the present green political, economic and social picture, investing in sustainable farming and local population right to good food constitute an essential starting point to reconnect reciprocal social economic networks of care across the country and at the same time lessen dependence on food from abroad. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sara, uh, and your co-author. So we have now uh, about 25 minutes to discuss uh, to discuss these five papers that range quite broadly. Um, and we have attempted to post a couple questions already uh, in the chat. And uh, Raul and I just communicated and thought it might be a good idea if we just start at the top of these questions uh, and go through with the speakers, um, which would mean that uh, Lara would have an opportunity to pick up the questions that uh, are at the very, or near the top here. Would that be okay, Lara? Yes, of course. Okay. I just have to scroll up <laughs> to see um, which question here. Um, exactly, so how would I define or uh, characterize in a few words this uh, common language. So um, I would, um, well, in my dissertation, I found several characteristic of uh, language use. So let me try to summarize here, maybe the three most important ones. So first of all, ethical consumers um, uh, as a narrative community that uh, is a narrative community that defines itself through temporary temporality and urgency. So they do this with the consistency topos. So in all the interviews, there is the story of a near end of the world or a loss of the world as we know it. So I do it really short. So and the second characteristic I would say is that consumption is told as a work project. So my interview partner emphasized uh, on individual effort and performance. And as a third characteristic, I would name uh, the coming, yeah, coming of age story. So ethical consumption is told as a biographical process in which one's own values and knowledge are found. And so here I see a clear connection to the age group Christina is focusing on at universities. Um, exactly. So that would be a really uh, interesting discussion point. So, and uh, in addition to this characteristic, the actors take up the same figures of knowledge and motive. And I showed you one, it's the chick calling. It's funny, Regina, you responded, oh, we have that too. We heard that too. So this popular motive, another one is the Nestle steals water and so on. And here I see a really... Um, a connection to documentary films and also like um, when they and what films are popular at the time. So when I did my field work, the True Cost film was popular. So it was um, 
the story of the uh, Raja Plaza um, that was really popular in my in my interviews. So I think uh, those are the three or the four uh, characteristics. So and uh, I pick up again. I think your question is the next, or it's not a question. It's more an um, uh, a comment. Um, so yes, of course, uh, the speech acts are always not like that true, uh, as you would call it, but they are rhetorically effective. And also for me, it was really important that they are performatively effective. So showing uh, one other, like that I do ethical consumption, show it to others, it needs this communitive act. So that's why I was focusing uh, in this paper uh, on the language use. Yeah. Uh, Alex, do you want to pick up from your side on the the issue of how how um, actors along the food or the production chain are kind of helpless vis-a-vis -vis those very communicative acts or performative acts? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for uh, this comment. Um, yeah. Because um, this is exactly one of the main problems our actors point to, um, that there are demands they face um, that they don't um, agree with or that they can't um, fulfill um, in their work. And they again and again criticize um, especially generalizing ideas about um, what should be done and or what needs to be done, um, how agriculture and consumption should work. work. Um, so for, from the farmer's perspective, um, but also the perspective of other actors um, along the supply chain, um, they again and again point to those very um, circumstances or specific environments um, that have to be taken in account um, before you formulate such demands. Um, but from the consumer perspective, there's so much that they don't, that we don't know. Um, that this is rather unlikely, I guess. But yeah. Thank you. So next, we have a question formulated in two parts. I guess the first part is uh, directed to Alexandra, you know, about the interviewees, and then uh, maybe Lara can follow. Um. Is the question uh, uh, asked by uh, Gunnar Oli Dagmarason? Is there in the? Yeah, I'm scrolling. Um, yeah. That's the question um, about the interviewees um, talking about spreading the message of veganism. Um, um, is it possible that this question is actually addressed at Laura? Because uh, we did not talk to people about veganism. Um, in our interviews. So I'm a little confused. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Where, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit lost in scrolling. Uh, the question so was, um, I mean, it's a question addressed probably to Christina, but, well, Christina is just in the search part at the moment, where, where there's some interviewees saying they were trying to spread the message of veganism by pointing out that the products were better than the non-vegan ones, saying something like try substituting milk for almond milk, minced meat for vegan, um, minced meat, and so on. Uh, when the ethic point does not translate, does the better product translate or better or, or do they attempt to translate into the specifics? I think this was for Lara, no? <laughs> I can answer it well. It's really a short answer. No, they didn't. <laughs> I didn't, uh, they didn't in my interviews. It was not about uh, pr like the better product, worse product, better in taste. 
uh, it's it was funny actually that they never really um, talked about the taste of products at all um, in my interviews. But as I said, my field work was done five years ago, so uh, the the piece meat and all that was in another state and it's right now. And I have this old uh, material that I can talk about, but in my case, no, they didn't. I think I can also try to answer this question. Uh, so I actually, I, I, I have not also asked this in my interviews because I asked for PhD, I still have not done the, that part of the field work, but just like observing on, on like an online content from Taiwan and China, there, there are some videos like from the two um, channels that I show where they do those taste tests or like maybe make, make this meal and try to give it to the general population to try and see the reaction. But I I have not really seen if this has just translate into any outcome yet. Sorry. I think I can say something uh, about taste. <laughs> Uh, from what I have understood so far, uh, taste is a very important factor uh, to vegetarianism, actually. Uh, students sometimes they choose a vegetarian option because it tastes better, or they don't choose it because they use this, that's it, a, a meat substitute that is too industrial and it tastes a bit weird for them. So there is a whole, um, yeah, I think it's, taste is really important, actually, at least from what I gather. And I have also conducted a research with vegans uh, during my master's. Um, and indeed, in that case, taste was a secondary thing. I think the most important thing to the people I have talked to, at least, and they were all anti-speciesists. So it was really a matter of animal rights. So that was the only thing that mattered. Uh, only after, okay, if I have an option of vegan products, then I would choose the one that tastes better. But maybe um, they would eat something that isn't really that good for them uh, if they're saving an animal's life, etc. So uh, I think the taste is not really that relevant depending on the reasons why uh, you were consuming those products. And concerning the other question, uh, the, well, the comment from Regina about um, speech uh, and then speech acts not necessarily being true. And sometimes they're not true even concerning their practices <laughs> because during interviews, uh, with vegans, I have realized that some vegans may eat eggs, for example, if their mother owns the chickens. So they have a different approach to ethics depending on their own personal experience, but they will not uh, share that with others publicly. So it really, there's only during an interview that will last maybe two hours after you meet them a few times, they will share with you the sort of information. So that's really true. <laughs> Yeah, I had I had asked a question also um, of Christina, but I think it also pertains to Sara because it echoes in the in the primary data or the setting that you work in. We live in a time where knowledge that comes from universities is socially not exactly. Uh, I mean, we have a lot of resistance against uh, academics and higher institutions of higher learning. And in Sarah's paper, it comes out with the with the um, smallholder farmers being reluctant to give so much time to researchers, and uh, well, because they actually would rather have assistance. And with Christina, I was wondering, um, having policy that targets specifically institutions of higher learning to to turn students into. Uh, those who diffuse the uh, the meatless or plant based diet, whether they can even uh, what the public acceptance thereof will be. I mean, the it would I think it would be really interesting to enlarge your um, uh, scope of looking also in terms of how those actors who are supposed to spread the gospel of uh, meatless diet fair, let's say, I mean, you have all these universities more in southern France, that's Le Pen ter territory. So <laughs> I'm just wondering how that how that will go together. Yeah, I thank you for the suggestion, because I haven't thought of this aspect before. Um, I think we probably trust researchers and universities if the results of their researches are useful to our goals. Uh, and in this case, they are not for some people. 
but I do plan, uh, I was already planning to include a discussion on the negative reactions to actions in universities, especially because this is very clear in France, a bit less in Portugal, and because it has already been mentioned in the interviews I have conducted so far in Coimbra, for example, in Portugal, uh, since last year, meat was excluded from the menu. And there was a negative reaction at the moment, uh, but nothing now. So it's over. Portuguese society does not demonstrate as much as the French one. Um, and many aspects of the reduction of meat consumption are easily accepted in Portugal. So you can see that by the law that makes universities offer a vegan option. And the bill that originated that law included aspects uh, unimaginable in France, at least for now, such as animal rights. So this is something that in France is almost like a taboo, right? Um, and in France, there are reports of strong reactions to the inclusion of uh, vegan meals or even to the organization of one vegan day. There were lots of reactions because in one day, one university offered only vegan meals. Um, and in this case, it was mainly because an association was involved. It was this L214 association. It's the biggest one uh, in that theme in France. So, yeah, I think in France, this is indeed an important aspect to observe and to see if there are dif regional differences, since I will be in contact with very uh, universities in different regions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> now there is a question for Sarah about the National Gene Bank and what kind of institution is it? because it's under a ministry, but it has also a kind of relative autonomy. Can you tell a bit more about it? Yes, sure. Yes, uh, the position of the gene bank is indeed uh, ambiguous. Uh, it's uh, located uh, under the Minister of Environment, so not directly under the Minister of Agriculture. And this has already uh, is on uh, political problematic for the Tunisian, uh, you know, political landscapes. And, but uh, I, I don't want to go into details into that. Um, uh, but the gene bank, so it is an autonomy, autonomous entity and is, uh, it is allowed to have, uh, um, to receive fundings from other countries as and many other gene banks across Europe or the world. Um, and again, uh, obviously the mandate of the gene bank is to preserve genetic uh, um, biodiversity. So the official one uh, is, um, is, uh, is that. But as Amin always remarks, and also as I was trying to uh, emphasize with my paper, um, so you cannot do that by disconnecting um, the seeds from the farmers. And if you um, want to preserve the genetic uh, uh, makeup of seeds, because it's important for food uh, um, sovereignty of Tunisia, uh, attempting also to uh, you know, lessen the dependence uh, of uh, food import from abroad. Um, all the researchers at the Bing Gene, uh, gene Bank are uh, actually uh, aware of their role in um, promoting the role of smallholders with uh, uh, the Minister of Agriculture. So the law would be um, just a first step to push uh, uh, her social also rehabilitation of the image of the small older as, uh, you know, uh, not modern enough a social actor. Uh, and so you cannot, again, disconnect these, uh, at least this is uh, the intention of the, uh, the drafting process, uh, not again to disconnect uh, the, the catalog of seed from the people and the role of people, um, the role of farmers in the process. And of course, as I try to comment, the attempt is massive because there are lobbies, interest, international and national. There are, uh, yes, uh, friction between the two ministers. Um, uh, the current political situation in Tunisia is tragic. And there are, you know, geopolitical influences from Europe. So we are not only talking about the goodwill of a bunch of actors, but <laughs> an unfortunate conjunction, uh, which... Uh, in which people are still trying to act upon. And uh, um, so despite the risk, despite the risk of, uh, you know, patenting and all that, uh, the, the willingness of um, networks, international networks and Tunisian networks are um, present and the, the, techni the technicalities are, 
under discussion. Um, and this is the risks are to be weighed against the marginalities that use on the farmer disappearing. And then, uh, you know, Europe claims that uh, uh, migrants are arriving. Uh, so, so it's obviously very, very complex and multi-layered the, um, political um, issue. And um, yes, uh, the question was more <laughs> punctual, but uh, the answer well, is a, a little bit all over the place. Um, yeah, I think the prevalent, uh, the attempts need to be acknowledged and then uh, if, and uh, they managed to go through um, many actors, researcher and uh, farmers and so far and so on needs to be uh, at work to avoid risk and commodification of the seeds. I thought it was really interesting that you brought in that um, that quote from Marilyn Strathern of regarding the quality of social relationships, uh, because it really is interesting to have that 1999 law that is a policy coming from the center, basically, uh, with a modernization agenda and higher yield. And it then takes more than 20 years or uh, 20 or two decades to recognize actually we need to go back on a level of of uh, equalizing more or less the social relationships and, and get at a level of um, doing seed policy in this regard or food policy that is on a more on a more uh, equal footing or taking in account the specific social settings that uh, people are people are in. You asked a question also still of Christina about the, Christina's positionality in the research project. Maybe we'll take that as our last question then. Thank you. Um, yes, although I have studied veganism and antispeciesism before, I'm not vegan. I'm not an activist of any kind. I don't think that universities should exclude meat uh, from canteens, but I am vegetarian. Uh, and I'm very happy to be able to eat at canteens as a student. Uh, and I have started this journey to try to understand why out of a sudden, more or less, I could not eat meat anymore. So since my first master's thesis, that was my personal ambition. So uh, my previous research in ethnology allowed me to dive in this theme and experiment with vegan uh, food. But I also had to eat meat in another research uh, in farm animal conservation because I was uh, at a farmer's house and he offered me his meat. So this is all very stimulating for me on a personal level, and I'm not taking any parts in this story. I just think that it's really important to have option and not exclude anyone. And vegetarian meals, uh, well, someone who eats meat could eat them as well. So that's it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I was just curious because, yeah, when... Uh when I hear that the policy level, the university wants to promote something, it sounds to me as they're saying, they're already expressing a judgment and they're saying, oh, uh, you guys are not doing good enough. So that there is always this uh, dichotomous way of thinking, which is uh, also internalized. <laughs> <laughs> it's also, as Regina was uh, saying, maybe um, good to keep an eye on your research on the effects of these kind of well, this is important for us and we wanted to stress it in our practices every day as to, yes, yeah, saying uh, up to now, um, the practices were not, again, uh, up, well, good or um, inclusive enough. Um, yeah, just a comment. Yeah, yeah, this reflexive part of the research to me is one of the most interesting ones. The, the fact that through our research we can actually understand ourselves better i think i wouldn't be able to pursue a phd if it wasn't interesting to me in a personal level and in this case it's really interesting so uh, i'm really motivated by it and i'll keep an eye certainly on how my own beliefs uh, interfere somehow with my research i think that's very interesting more than important <laughs> thank you christina for this important remarks for everyone <laughs> or doing research. And uh, with this, it's time to close the session. Uh, I would like to thank again uh, uh, Ines, the volunteer, for her technical support. I'd like to thank uh, all the presenters and also all the attendants. We were around 30 people, which is not too bad. I hope 
uh, you have enjoyed the session. Thank you again. Thank you, Regina, for uh, having the idea to create this panel. And uh, yeah, hope to see you soon in a, no, personally, not virtually anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you all. Good afternoon. Good afternoon yep. to everyone. Thank you so yep. much. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.